Well, good evening, everybody out there in Facebook world. It's good to be back with you again. Those of you that are joining me via Zoom, as I'm sure more more folks will jump on in the next few minutes. But um, it is good to be with you again for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Let's pray, and then uh, and then we will jump in to God's Word. <sighs> Father, I just thank you right now for your goodness for your kindness, for your, just the way that you are always with us, that you never uh, leave us or forsake us, that even in the moments that uh, things don't make sense to us, you are right there. You are not far away. You are near. And Lord, I pray that tonight, Lord, as we open up these, just as I was reading through these these words today, Oh my goodness, Lord, there's so much here that I need uh, to, to get a fresh revelation of. And I just pray that as we go through this together, Lord, that the revelation of the love of Jesus would be awakened on the inside of us, that we would all be given the gift of fresh uh, uh, kisses of the Word of God tonight, that we would be given the gift of beautiful, holy encounters with the Holy Spirit, the new things that we've never heard before, not new to you, but new to us, would uh, just be burned upon our spirits, that we'd be awakened to to a, a greater and a deeper hunger for you than we've ever known or we've ever had before. Oh, I just ask that in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we are in the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. We are going to be jump. We are going to be starting on chapter four, which means this is our our halfway point. This is the halfway point on the journey of the Shulamite woman from insecure but longing for her Lord to deeply desiring Him, but living in the reality that his and he is hers and that her desire is for him and um and uh tonight we're really going to spend almost all of our time hearing him speak over her and 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 talk to her and draw her further in deeper in than um she's ever gone before and so i really hope that this is an encouraging time for everybody um so let's kind of do a quick recap. Remember, this story begins when the Shulamite woman, the, the young woman, the female character in the story, which represents us in the relationship between us and God, um, that she, she desires the king. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, um, he invites her in. He takes her into his chambers. She prays this, this prayer, draw me away with you. Let us run together. And then they go, and they go through a couple of different little little scenes. Uh, they go from these touching scenes of intimacy and closeness, where she sees him as he is, and she's awakening to his love for her. And she's, uh, but then she'll go f fall back into her own insecurity and fear, or uh, uh, maybe even laziness. Maybe um, you know, if I, she, he comes and he invites her to go with him up onto the mountains and. She says no, and she refuses to go. Um, and then she realizes that she has that she she has missed him, and so she goes and pursues him. And uh, and that's what happened in this last the last uh, time that we were together. Oh no, no, that was two times ago. Um, uh, she went and pursued him, and and uh, and left her place of comfort to find him. And then and then she finds him almost immediately. And, uh, and, um, then last week we talked about, she is coming to realize that she can trust him, that she's living in, she, she, through that whole thing, that she was gaining a perspective that she could trust him, that he was safe, that her heart was safe with him. So that's where we are at. And tonight we are going to go into song, uh, to, into chapter four. And uh, we are going to uh, we are going to begin to hear him really sing over her and say some things to her. 
Susan, it says you've raised your hand. What do you got to say? I did raise my hand. <laughs> I had a question. Um, you talked about this just a little bit last week about all the possible meanings about the silver this and the gold that. Yes. Um, but I was just a little bit curious if there was any significance that you saw in, in talking about the crown with it, with which his mother crowned him on the wedding day. What, you know, it, I just thought it was interesting that it talked about his mother crowning him and on the day of his wedding. Do you have any insight in that? Uh, my understanding of it is, and, and it's been a minute uh, since I've looked into that specific symbol, but my understanding of it is he was already the king. Um, but that in that this was a special gift, maybe a wedding gift coming to to him from his mother, um, and that that you know a special crown, not that he hadn't been crowned before, or that, uh, but on this special occasion that he was given a new crown or a different crown. Maybe it has to do with becoming a uh, you know a husband, although. Solomon had lots of wives, so I, and I don't know that this was his first. I don't think it was, um, but uh, but this was this day of gladness for him, and it was his wedding day. It was his wedding day with the Shulamite woman, and she's seeing him wearing that that keepsake, that remembrance. Uh, I do think, you know, all through the scriptures we find this picture of of the people of God being the crowning glory of God that we that our uh, his possession of us his I, I don't want to say that like demon possession that's that's not what I'm talking about but like the fact that he has a people um, uh, uh, speaks to the world of his kingship and his authority and uh, and that uh, I think I'm trying to think like Isaiah 62. He talks about uh, the what he's saying over Israel. You are my royal diadem. You are you my my scepter. Um, and I think maybe these are those those kinds of things are connected. That there is in some way uh, God having a people like us um, demonstrates His authority to mankind. Demonstrates His His glory to mankind and isn't that is what what uh you know who we're supposed to be and what our role is is to be the 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 revealers of god the imagers of god into the world that we are uh nt Wright calls us angled mirrors reflecting god into the world and reflecting the world back up to god um but that there is this and and we were called to rule and so maybe it's there's some connection there um like I said before, I, I, I try and stay away, and we're going to do this big time tonight. There is a ton of symbolic language in, in this chapter and these next few verses that we're going to read together. And I am going, I'm not going to focus in on specific symbols unless I think they're important to the story uh, specifically, like, unless they have a very... Uh, of a very, you know, they play a, an important role in the story and in what's going on between in the relationship between the the king and his bride, um, and he's going to say a lot of things about her. Uh, I mean, it, well, I mean, I'll get to it in a minute, but but we're but I want to say, and there's lots of people who will, and there have been many many people in the past who have, uh, like uh, spent a lot of time drilling down onto each of those symbols and trying to unfold their meaning and i'm probably not going to be i'm not going to do that in in this time that we have together i don't think that's an, a horrible thing to do but other people have done it and have done it way better than me um but uh way better than i ever could but uh but uh i i'm going to focus on this storyline of hers where she is the the and her growth in in the king so um did, did that help at all, Susan? I... Yes. I, and like I said, this is just interesting how, you know, we're, we're talking about, I really think this is kind of an important um, thing about this idea of us 
being crowned and us ruling with him. And so that's kind of what I was asking if that kind of had yes. some symbology because um, there's been a lot of prophetic words right now about us taking our place of authority and being crowned crowned to rule and reign and and move in this in this next season yeah. and you know it with this whole thing with the coronavirus meaning crown it's like mm. we're going to take the crown from the world and whatever mm. satan wants to do and now you know the, this realization that we are crowned we have the authority mm. so i just thought it was really cool that we're studying this and then this other stuff is going on now so yeah i i i think it's in absolutely vital that the body of Christ understands that the reason we have to get it in our heads that the reason we have been saved uh, is to be in relationship with Jesus that is that looks like partnership with him in the place of authority and rulership um, uh, and what that looks like I mean there's and there's so much Lord I could I could go on for hours about that and we would never get to uh song of solomon 4 but um this understanding that god has saved us released um you know filled us with the holy spirit released resurrection life in us so that Resurre resurrection life can move through us. That's what that's what rulership looks like. The imaging of God that I talked about a minute ago. That's what rulership looks like. That's what Adam's rulership was meant to look like. That's what and look what God called him to do. God called him to recognize and and give identity to to all of creation, which we're still doing, and that's a that's a really fascinating thing. But Anyway, I'm getting way out of Song of Solomon, but but yes, I agree. Uh, the body of Christ needs to understand uh, n now more than ever in history what we were saved for, that we were saved to be in relationship with God that enables us to take up the human vocation, that for which we were created, so our salvation is is God giving us back that which we were created to do. And what we were created to do was rule with him. That's what we were created to do. That's how that is what God said about us from the beginning. Let us make man in our image that he may rule over all of creation. This is what we've been called to do. To reflect to image God into the world and to uh to to rule the way Jesus did. Boy. Okay. All right. I'm done now. That part's over. We're going to move on to, to Solomon uh, chapter 4. Okay, so I'm going to read it. This is the New American Standard. Um, and uh, I'll just read the first eight verses and then we'll dive in a little bit. Okay, how beautiful. Remember, this is him speaking over her. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. Now, I know people make fun of some of this language because it's not its not the language of our culture, but it was the language of theirs, and it's this is considered by many to be one of the most beautiful love poems ever written. So just, I know, you wouldn't tell your girlfriend she has hair like a flock of goats, okay? Most of us wouldn't do that, but back then that was beautiful imagery, so... Just get past it. Um, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost her young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stones, on which are hung thousand shields, all the, all the round shields of the mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle which feed among the lilies. Until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether love beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon, journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Okay, 
Like I said, there's a lot of things that he's saying over her. But let's, let's well, first of all, recognize once again, uh, he says, your eyes are like doves. That's something he deeply prizes about her. And he says it over and over again to her. And remember that that symbol. That's why I describe that symbol. That's why I talk about that symbol, because it's repeated constantly throughout this book. Your eyes are like doves. Your eyes are like doves. What does it mean? It means they're focused on him and him only. He ha she has a singular focus on her love for her king. And that means everything to him. That just stirs his heart. And it stirs the heart of our God when we love him <laughs> with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. That stirs the heart of our God. He loves that about her. He's speaking over her. Listen to what the things that he's saying to her. You know, they haven't had the perfect relationship. They've had a couple of little, of little uh, issues along the way. But his desire for her is obvious. And he calls her beautiful uh, multiple times. And then he goes into... I love this. Well, hear the voice of Jesus saying to you that you are pleasing to him, that he likes to be with you, that he likes, that he desires your presence, that he loves when you're around, that he loves the things about you. That's that's the thing about verses two through five. He picks out each little detail of of her face, her body, her clothing, the way that she looks. He he knows every detail about her, but even more amazing, because we can all picture God knowing every detail about us, right? We all know God's like Santa Claus. He sees us when we're sleeping. He knows when we're awake, right? We all know <laughs> All of that. And and sometimes we feel, uh, uh, you know, that, that that scares us or that makes us. We It's easy for us, I think, to recognize that God knows us well. But what is difficult for us to recognize, the thing that's hard for us, is to believe and to take on this truth that God delights in every part of who we are. Man, that's hard. Can it be that our king takes delight in every part of who we are? Is that possible? How could he love all of me? I know me. You know you. How could he love all of me? How could he look at every part of me and find something there that he loves, even cr that he desires? I, I find this. I've studied this book since I was 13 years old. And I find this truth, this reality... So hard when I was reading this earlier today to prepare for tonight. I'm reading this going, how is it possible? <laughs> There's so many things about me that I despise. There's so many things about me that I wish were different. There's so many things about me that I that I, I long to see change. And it isn't that Jesus doesn't want us to grow into wholeness. He does. But there is not one aspect of our being that he does not find a measure of delight in. That he does not find, he, he loves us even in the midst of our immaturity. Even in the midst of our getting it wrong most of the time. Even in the midst of us not understanding of, of us. <sighs> How can it be? There's the, and I think I've mentioned this book before. It's a book I would recommend, and I think you can actually download it for free off the internet. It's called The Seven Longings of the Human Heart, and it's by Mike Bickle and Dana Candler. And I would, I would 
tell anybody to read that book. And it goes through and it, it lists off. And maybe that's something we should do together is walk through those seven longings. But it lists off seven desires that live in the heart of every human being that uh, God created and that God wants to be there, but that can only be satisfied in our relationship with God. That the, n- none of these desires can be satisfied solely through other humans or through a right understanding of who we are. All of them must be satisfied in God. And, you know, um, uh, I was thinking about Ravi Zacharias today. He passed away. Um, and everybody's talking about him on the internet. But one, he's, he's an, He did a lot of apologetics. And I never heard him talk about this sp- uh, p- particularly. Um, but m- many people who do apologetics, I'm not sure what you would call that person. An apologist? I don't know. But many people who do apologetics point to the, des- the deep desires of the human heart that can only be satisfied by the God described in the Bible as one argument for the God that's described in the Bible. That all of us long for a God who is just like Jesus, every, every single one of us. And the fact that here we have a God who is Jesus and who is just like Jesus says that this the human soul was created for him and him for us. Well, he wasn't created, but we were created for him. And he is for us. One of those desires, one of the seven desires of the human heart in that book is, is the desire for intimacy without shame. And intimacy without shame is not possible. It's, it, you know, many of us feel a measure of it with our spouses. We're not... You know, we were able to reveal who we are uh, to them without any kind of shame. Um, but our spouses will never know every thought that we've ever thought. They will never know every word that we've ever said or everything that we've ever did, done. Uh, but God does. And that God who knows everything about us, internal, external, he knows more about us than we do. That God is the God who sees each part of us and says, I find you desirable. All of who you are is, some, is desirable to me. And that reality, that reality right there, if we can begin to believe that, it will change who we are top to bottom. It will shift us completely we begin to believe, just begin to believe that God loves all, God loves us, and that God desires each part of us as we are, and we can come to him without shame and without fear, and we can be free to love him completely. Because it's only when we really understand his full love for us that we will begin to love him back the way that we should. He names off all these parts, all these things about her, each individual part, and he's obviously enjoying what he's seeing and what he's and what he's experiencing with her. And I'm not going to go in like I said many people would go into the to the you know what is it what does it mean that her neck is like a tower? We're we're not going to go there. We're just we're just not going to go there tonight. If you want to, you can go look up uh there's there's tons of people that would you know, you could find uh, resources that would take you through all those details and talk to you about what the possible symbolic meanings are of all those. I'm not going to do that tonight. All right, so then verse 6, Until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh 
and to the hill of frankincense. That's the Lord speaking. The Lord comes to us to enjoy us. You know, the Bible says that he spends time thinking about us. The number of thoughts in his head about us outnumber the sands, on the, the grains of sand on the seashore. He cherishes the time that we spend together. Uh, if I really understood this, I would spend much more time in prayer. I believe that. <laughs> if I got this in my bones, how can I stay away from the place of prayer? If I understood that God loves to be with me, that God loves it when I come into, you know, I often think we think of God as kind of, you know, rolling his eyes and sighing when we come into his presence, like them again. I suppose I have to, t I have to listen to them because I said I would, but that is not who he is. I think of him as, as a God, you know, a, a fiery lover sitting on the edge of his chair, just waiting for our presence. Just waiting for our attention, just waiting for us to come into the into his to to become aware of his presence, which is all around us. To remember that he's with us, to be awakened once again to the truth that he is here, and for us to begin to speak to him and talk to him and hear his voice. The mountain of myrrh. Uh, I will talk about this because this is mentioned several times also, and it's significant. The mountain of myrrh is a um, is a it represents difficulty, and the hill of frank frankincense represents rejoicing or celebration. And this is this is something that's become really really important to me in the last few years. Is Jesus' presence in the midst of my hardest times? Um, that Jesus is there. Uh, I'm a, I have been a part of a, a leadership cohort uh, the last couple years, and there's these seven axioms. I preached on them a few, um, few months ago. And one of them is, uh, th these, are, these are the things Jesus believed about God and the world. And, and one of them is that God meets us where we really are. Not where we wish we were, not where we should have been, not where he's not waiting for us somewhere. No, no, no. He meets us where we are. So if we're, in a, if we're in, if we're on the mountain of myrrh, in difficulty, in sorrow, in fear, he's going to meet us there. He's got things to say to us there. And he's going to enjoy us there. That's the picture of this. He says, he says I'm going to go there. Uh, and I'm going to stay there all night with you. I'm going to go there and I'm going to stay there all night with you. I'm going to sit with you in the midst of your sorrow. Sit with you in the midst of brokenness. Sit with you in the midst. I, I have things to say to you in the midst of your, of, of your pain. I have things to say to you in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your confusion. I have things to say to you in those places. But I'm also going to be with you on the hill of frankincense. I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to dance with you. I'm going to celebrate with you. He is committed to encountering us in every moment of our lives and to stay in that place of encounter as often and as long as we need him there. What a wonderful God we have. And then he says this, You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. First of all, altogether lovely, that's these words. We sing those about him, right? You're going to find that many of the phrases we use for Jesus come from Song of Solomon, and almost all of them are him saying those things about us. Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, altogether lovely. <laughs> those are all things he's saying to us about us. Mind-blowing shocker, but that's the truth.
You are, and then he says this mind-blowing thing here. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no blemish in you. Now, if you are like me, you're saying, Jesus, you need new glasses. Or else you're looking at a photoshopped <laughs> picture of me. There's a lot of blemishes, Jesus. And he's saying, no. He's speaking prophetically over us. He's speaking of how he sees us and he is not deluded. He sees all of us, the end and the beginning and all of in between. He sees who we will be because he knows. He's the one. As it says in the New Testament, he, it is God who is working both to will and to do the, thing, the things that he wants us to do. God is at work in us. We are God's workmanship, right? We are his workmanship. And he's looking at us and saying, oh, you're not done yet. Remember that old song? He's still working on me, right? Jesus sees that we are a work in progress and he loves us in the midst of our immaturity. He loves who he is forming us into. And he says, I've got everything I need to make exactly the bride that you were created to be, that I created you to be. There's no blemish in you. That's shocking. That's shocking. But hear it tonight. Hear him say it to you. You are altogether lovely and there is no blemish in you. Hear it. Let these words go past don't just let them bounce off your awareness let them let them move past your doubt and your fear and let them let them get into your soul and hear it from your king that he is delighted in you that he loves you that he desires you that you belong to him and that he sees you as altogether lovely. He loves the journey we're on. He loves the yes we're able to give him now. The yes we're able to give him now is enough for now. The yes we're able to give him now is enough for now. He's calling us into deeper maturity, of course. He's not going to leave us where we are, but he loves us in the midst of the journey. He's not impatient. He knows his own power and his ability to bring us to the end. So uh, Jude one twenty four, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's Jesus we're talking about to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before his Father's presence with great joy. It's my bride, Father. Here she is. Isn't she beautiful? Colossians 1.22 He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death you, he has net, which he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is what he is at work doing. See the now and the not yet in these two verses. We are made perfect now. We are kept moving forward until the end. Jesus, you know, we stand justified, which means just as if I never sinned. We stand justified in Christ right now. That's where we are. That's who we are. When God looks at us, he does not see uh, a failure or a broken person. What he sees is his beloved, that he is forming into the nature of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. That's what he sees, and that's who we are. We need to just grab hold of that again. And then, here it comes again, verse 8. Come with me. Remember? He said it before. He said it before. And now he's saying it again. 
come with me. And he names these places, these mountains, these far off places. It's the call of the bridegroom to move back into the place of maturity, back into the place of adventure, to move forward to all he knows we are capable of. Remember, we asked him for this first. We, He's not asking us to do something we didn't request. We said, draw us after you and let us run. That was our request. And now he's saying, I want you to go. And the, look at the places uh, I, I have in the past looked up all these places. Basically, they're all very wild. There's a lot of wilderness there. In fact, one of the places from the den of lions and the mountain of leopards. I mean, these are not safe places. They're dangerous places. They're wild places. And they're mountainous. They're up there. And he's calling us to go with him. Come with me, he says. Come with me from the place of comfort. And let's do something impossible together. Let's leave this place of ease and sanctuary. And let's go off and let's do something that you don't believe you can do. I think that's amazing. He actually believes that we can do it. In the next part, he begins to tell us more about, um, about how he feels about us. And if you think that we've already... <laughs> I, just, I, I need to sit for a minute and think about the things that we've just said. Because where we're going are even higher heights. Okay, what he's about to say is even more dramatic than what he's already said. Now, I am, my love language is words of affirmation. That may not be true of all of you, uh, but that's my love language. And so this kind of word, these kinds of words to me, they do a lot to me. And uh, But Jesus knows how to speak your language too. And I, I my prayer is that as we go through this, that uh, that that he does that. That would be an interesting thing to go through the Gospels and find Jesus communicating love via all of the love languages, because he absolutely does. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but I'll have to think about that for another time. So, verse nine: <sighs> You have made my heart beat faster. My sister, my bride, you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. Forgive me. The God of all creation, the Genesis 1 God, the bigger than the universe God. Says that he's affected by our affections. He's moved by our attention. Our desire for him, our love for him, excites him. To think, he, sa he says, my heart beats faster when you just glance at me. A single glance of your eyes, single strand of your necklace. And I'm set off. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> How 
How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Our love for him, it, he enjoys and delights in our love for him. He considers it precious. He considers it to have worth. Can you hear this? Do you understand that the God who holds all things together by the word of his power is delighted by your love for him? That his heart is moved by your attention on him? That he is, that, that, that this God, this God, this God that is beyond any of our abilities to comprehend or to or to understand that he he oh, I, I, i'm speechless i don't have words for this but i'm just praying in the name of jesus that this revelation would just be pushed through these stupid cameras and microphones and that it would go out and that it would grab a hold of some of us me included that we would be shaken to the core by our god that he loves, that he desires us, that we love him. Oh God, I want to believe this. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon, the fruit of my lips, my songs, and my prayers. I do a lot of singing to Jesus. I've been a worship leader for 20 plus years. I've done a lot of singing to Jesus, and I have to admit that some of it's not been very good. And I have to admit that some of it has been half-hearted, but Jesus hears it, and it stirs him. It's like honey. It's beautiful to him. He desires it. He longs for it. It is sweet for him. The overflow of my heart is his delight. Lebanon was known for its cedar trees. And if you've ever been in a, in a pine grove, my, my mom grew up in Colorado and you go up on these mountainsides when the wind blows through the pine trees he says he says the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of lebanon when the wind blows through the pine trees that fragrance it's so refreshing it's so revitalizing it's so that i could be refreshing for jesus I'm sorry, I'm really having trouble tonight. Not, <laughs> I'm so stirred. I pray that you are as well. To know one of the other desires of the human heart from that book, and I really do think you should get it, is the knowledge that I am enjoyable or how do they put it desirable attractive we all want to feel attractive we all, all want to feel desirable we all want to be the person that people are glad is around and especially someone that we really love and to hear that jesus loves when we're with him. I need to know that. I need it. 
I need to know that. I need it. I need that deep inside. I need to know that that, that Jesus doesn't resent my presence. That Jesus loves when I'm around. I need that. Verse 12, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a, a rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. This, this, this thing where he keeps calling her my sister, my bride, this wasn't an incestuous relationship. It's just that they're connected in this way. Um, it's a term of endearment. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. In other words, she's so enjoyable, but she's only for him. It's a lot like the dove's eyes idea, except that this means she's faithful. She's only for him. He's the only one that gets to enjoy uh, her. And uh, that's something he loves. One of the things that Jesus, that, that, that God is so wants and desires so much is is that from us um he even tells us in exodus when i am a jealous god another place uh i want to say also in exodus he actually says my name is jealous that that's my name and and sometimes when we think about the word jealous we kind of go Ooh, i mean that's how could god be jealous like jealous of me why would god be jealous and and the answer is there, there's a right kind of jealousy. There is a there is a righteous jealousy, a jealousy that comes from um, uh, ownership. I don't like that word, but a, a jealousy that comes from I'm the only one who has a right to this. So if 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 I heard my wife saying really affectionate things about some other man and it didn't stir me to not feel good <laughs> i would be a pretty bad husband right i should feel she's my bride she's my wife and we have an exclusive relationship that's what marriage is it's an exclusive relationship um there are things that she expects from me that no one else gets and and when god says I'm jealous, I'm a jealous God, or my name is Jealous. What he's saying is, all of you belongs to me. You're mine. I, I bought you with my blood. And you're mine. Not only that, I also created you. But you. You belong to me. And anything else is inappropriate, and I don't want you being stirred by any other lover. I don't want you pursuing any other person. I don't want you going after anybody else that, uh, but me. And, and, and it is right that God should feel that way about us. And, uh, and, um, it is his delight when we belong only to him. And I think that, uh, we're really bad at this church i i think that uh that we need to learn once again how to be uh that there are things in us that should only belong to god that he should be all that truly satisfies us Because idolatry is still a sin. And it's a sin because it destroys us. It grieves the Holy Spirit as well. When we pursue other means or methods for being satisfied. When God is there. You know, Jeremiah chapter 2. One of my all-time favorite verses. My people have committed two evils. 
They have dug for themselves cisterns. Broken. They have forsaken, he says, they've forsaken the fountain of living water. That's him. And they've dug for themselves cisterns. Cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. He says, what is the deal? I'm the only satisfying thing and I'm the infinitely satisfying thing. And yet you go out into the dry and you try and you create these <laughs> these completely worthless copies of me that will never satisfy you. You walk away from the most satisfying thing and you pursue something that will never, ever satisfy you. It will take all of your life, all of your love, all of your labor, but it will never satisfy you. And don't we do that? Don't we find things over and over that steal from us again and again and again that don't satisfy us, and yet we give them our lives, and yet when God comes to pour out his love into us. We don't have time for him. I'm so guilty of that. And I'm sure you are too. All the treasures of my heart belong to him and him alone. Verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south, make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. I'm sorry, I should have said this is her voice now. So her response to what he has said to her, I love this, is awaken. She calls out to the wind and she asks the wind to blow on her and to carry her fragrance to him. He has just told her that she, uh, that he desires her and that everything about her is desirable. And now, so her response is, if everything about me is desirable, let everything about me that he desires, let it be carried to him so he will come. And I think it's really, really interesting because Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit, whose name, the word spirit and the word wind in, in Greek are the same word. And that's true in Hebrew as well. In Greek, it is pneuma. And in Hebrew, it's ruach. Okay. And um, to call the Holy Spirit to bring us Jesus. Ooh, I think that a call to the Holy Spirit, bring me Jesus. If he's delighted by me, let me delight him. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Do you see where she's at? She has him speaking all these things over her already, but she's like, I still want more. Woo! Lord, I want that. I want to be in that place where I'm in the midst of encounter with you. And yet I'm like, I still want more. Not, not out of some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, selfish, whatever, but just that, that all I, that the cry of my heart is going to be constantly, God, I, I want to know more of you. And this is, uh, this is also a promise. Some people see in the North wind and the South wind, a, uh, a, a kind of a mirror of the hill of frankincense and the, and the, the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense, that kind of, that the, that the north wind would be a delightful wind and the south wind would be a dry wind. And, and uh, I don't know how I feel about that, but, I, but I've, I've read that before. Um, but this is, this is... What I love about this request is that she's demonstrating that she believes him. Remember, her, her insecurity is really central to her immaturity in this story. And if she believes 
if she believes that Jesus desires her, that her king desires her, and she's asking for him to be drawn near via her desirableness, right? That means that she is beginning to believe that he actually longs for her. This is this is such a place of trust. She's saying, I I I I think I really believe he wants me. And so stir his desire for me so that we can be together. Um, that when he comes to me, he will enjoy me. Some of us flee or have you ever been kept from the place of prayer because you're disappointed in yourself? Because you're disappointed in In, in your in the things that you've done in your performance that you're disappointed in you know you've you've sinned or you didn't live up to something that you wanted to do and so you don't spend time in prayer have you been there I know I have um, and so for her to say let him come means she trusts him to want her when he arrives she trusts him to be stirred and to that that she will be with him that he will use the circumstances of life to make himself known to her and to bring her closer to him and to make her more fruitful that's a big deal And he responds almost immediately with chapter 5, verse 1, which says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and imbibe deeply, O lovers. So he responds to her cry and comes. And there he is with her again. And that's the close of our, of our scene. Uh, that he has heard her. He has smelled her fragrance from afar and he has come and he is being and he is with her and he is deeply satisfied in her and uh, and the the cry of her heart and his heart that they be together again is being answered so beautifully in that place. Well I am I am uh, I want to pray <laughs> for you and uh, and then we'll let you go. I, I hope that this I'm so stirred up right now and I'm I'm I don't know if I, I'm yeah I'm flustered because I'm really emotional right now be by this and I'm stirred by this and uh, and, and I want to believe all these things father I, I just I pray for everybody that would watch this that's with us now Let us believe that you desire us. Let us believe that you, I want to believe it. I want to believe it. I don't want it to just be nice words. I don't want it to just be something that I said on this video. I don't want it to be, I, I want to believe it in my DNA. I want to believe it in the core of who I am. I want to believe it no matter what my failing, I am the. De I am desired by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No matter what my brokenness that I am longed for by him, that he wants me to be with him, that he desires me, that he sings over me, that I am altogether lovely. I don't, can't, don't even know how to receive that. Holy Spirit. I pray over myself and every person that's out there right now. Give us the grace to believe. Give us the grace to know that we are the beloved of God, desired by the creator of all things, loved even in our immaturity, our brokenness, and our failing.
Breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Bring us Jesus. I ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. Pray that uh, you're doing well and that uh, the Holy Spirit breathes on you and you're ushered into Jesus' presence tonight. Amen.